Wow, great being here, guys. So, the story we're going to talk about today is actually happening in 1949. And this teenager was into the local library, and we are now in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, he picks up this book. And what he didn't know was that this book was going to change not just his life, but so many other lives in the years to come. He really took the book, rose it to fame, and it has sold more than a million copies already. Now, honestly, this is not so much about a teenager or even how he became known as the Oracle of Omaha, achieving more than $85 billion currently as his net worth. It's more about how reading the right book at the right time can truly change your life. Oh, and by the way, the name of this teenager, um, his name is Warren Buffett. <laughs> now, I'm here to talk about the intelligent investor and how to conduct value investing today. And honestly, for those of you who have been so lucky as to read The Intelligent Investor, it's a hard book to go through. Like, it was written in 1949, and it's, it can be a bit dry. It seems like the author, Benjamin Graham, he could be using a thousand words when a hundred will do. It's not an easy book to go through. But still, I'm standing here, and I would like to tell you why this is such an amazing book. Now, Benjamin Graham, in his own right, was an amazing hedge fund manager, before they were called hedge funds, worked in Wall Street, retired pretty young. Really what was important to him was to give back. So early on he got a job as a professor at Columbia University in New York City. And as the story goes, he taught there for as much as 22 years, and he gave only one A plus ever. Yes, that was to Warren Buffett, but still, he was, he was a tough guy. He was not a man easy to impress. He even turned down Warren Buffett whenever he offered to work for free after his A+, and he said, no. So he was a hard man to impress. But let's talk about some of the key premises here for the book and really for value investing. So the first concept I would like to talk about is really the concept of ownership. Yes, we do know that whenever you own a stock, you are a part owner of that company. That is what we're told, but that's typically not how we behave and how we react, not at all. We go in, we check the stock ticker, we see how the price fluctuates, sometimes several times a day, and it's almost like it's a game. But really, if you really truly think about it, you are a business owner. You are owners together with the other shareholders in that company. So let's, let's pretend that this guy would be coming to your office. And, and sometimes this business partner of yours, he would be in a great mood. I mean, he would be absolutely ecstatic. And he would be so happy that he would be offering fantastic prices, but since he's in such a good mood, it would be high prices for whatever he's selling, whatever he's buying. And then he is kind of like almost unstable, right? He would sometimes come and be so mad, be so frustrated, and he's just willing either to buy or sell the ownerships in this company, the goods he has for almost no money. Now, this is who Benjamin Graham calls Mr. Margaret. Of course, this is the fictitious business partner that we all have. That's the stock market of ours. And what he really learned really fast was that we can talk about price and we can talk about value. And Mr. Margaret has a really, really hard time separating the two. So what is price? Well, the price is pretty simple. We all know the price. We look on our phone, back then you probably looked in the back of the newspaper and you saw what is the stock trading at. 
but that's not the same as the value. Really what I'd like to talk to you about is what is value really and how is that different than the price? The one that we are faced with all the time, but probably not what we should really be focused about. No value investing, that is about truly understanding the value. Now, there are two takeaways really uh, to this concept. The first one is we must understand that we have these daily price fluctuations. It's just, it's something that is bound to happen. That's just the name of the game. And the second thing is, instead of, instead of looking at this volatility, as they call it, instead of looking at this, the price going up, the price going down, instead of being frustrated about that, be annoyed by that, how can we use it to our advantage? Can we, really, can we really make it to our advantage that we see all these fluctuations? And value investors would say, uh, yes, we can. So, Warren Buffett, he has this famous quote, and it almost seems like I'll be using Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham interchangeably. And that's true to some extent. He's talking about how you should be greedy when other people are fearful, and fearful when other people are greedy. And it seems so simple whenever you talk about it, whenever you talk to your friends about it, whenever you read it in a book. But in real life, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. You know, it's, it seems like it's whenever you can make a quick buck that we all run towards it. And whenever everyone is running for the hills, that's where it's absolutely hardest to stay in the market. But remember, if you always have an efficient market, if it was truly so that you didn't have all these price fluctuations, the things that distract us, the things that annoy us, how would you be able to, s to buy at a cheap price and, and sell at a high price? Especially if you're into individual stock picking, that is really what you're aiming for. So let's try and make volatility our friend. Now, I was so happy uh, and fortunate to see I could find a 100 euro note in my pocket here. So, if I made this untraditional business proposal that I would sell this to any one of you guys for 50 euros. Deal. So, a few of you might say that sounds like a great deal, right? I mean, why wouldn't you rather have 100 euros than 50 euros? The vast majority of you would probably say, he's scamming us. So we can't, no, that's not good. That's not good. But truly, that is how to look at stock investing. And that is how value investors look at it. Because they are looking for that stock that is trading at, call it 50 euro, but it's worth 100 euro. Of course, we run into quite a few problems in that process. It's pretty easy to come up with a number, a reasonable number for 100 euros. You would probably just want it at a discount. It's very, very difficult in the stock market, right? It's very difficult. It doesn't say anywhere what the true value, but the true value truly is. And it's hard, like even if both you and I, we are value investors unless we have the same assumptions in terms of the growth, in terms of the future cash flows, we will come up with two different valuations. So it's not easy, but it can be very, very profitable if you know how to value stocks. The price setting on something like stocks is just, just very different. If we look at product or a piece of food like pizza, yes, great. And what would happen if the price go, go up? Well, if the price goes up, we're probably more inclined to buy you know, substitutes for pizza. Uh, you'd buy a burger or something else. It kind of seems quite intuitive. And that is how basically all markets work, except for one market. That's the stock market. It's, it seems like whenever the price go up, Whenever your future returns are diluted, well, that's when people rush into the market. Because we just, we don't want to miss out on it, right? 
it almost doesn't matter if it's stocks or Bitcoin or real estate or whatever it is. It's whenever the price go up, that's really when it's on our radar. That's when everyone's talking about it. And very often it can work to your disadvantage. So really think about the stock market as any other product. Just like whenever milk is cheap, you might buy more milk or any other product. Think about it the exact same way. When it's on sale, that's the time to go in. It's, it's nothing more or nothing less, uh, I should say, than this. This is what they call uh, the margin of safety. What Benjamin Graham calls the margin of safety. So always, always, always make sure that you protect your downside by only buying into investments that has a higher value than the price. And some of the difficulties that we have here is simply the way the human mind is wired. So imagine this. Imagine that we would have two gentlemen here in the front row, and they would be storming out, right? They would just be storming out, screaming, running around screaming for the hills, right? Okay, so that would probably be somewhat weird, and you might be thinking, well, these two gentlemen have probably had a very important phone call, or something happened, a family emergency, whatever it, it might be. Okay, let's just keep sitting here and, and do whatever. But then imagine the opposite would happen, like everyone would just rush out of here. And these two gentlemen, they are none the wiser. They observe that anyone, everyone is just storming out, but they don't know anything has happened. They can't see a fire, they can't see anything, really. Okay, so what is the metaphor here? What is the metaphor really that we're talking about? Well, that is, it's so hard to control human emotions. It's so hard to do that because you're always, always, always influenced about your peers. So Sir Isaac Newton, un undoubtedly one of the greatest science uh, mind that we ever had in our history. He lost all his money in the stock market. He couldn't control his own emotions and you couldn't obviously control other people's emotions. We don't have to go too far back. In the 1990s, the very end, long-term capital management, the brightest people, or so they would say, on the planet at the time, they even had a few Nobel Prize winners in economics on, their, on the board. They couldn't control their own emotions. They simply lost out. And the company had to be bailed out. That is, that is so so hard. It's not about our IQ. If anything, value investing, making good investments, that's about temperament. Now, some of you might have a degree in finance or in economics. Okay, so we have a few people who are nodding and the rest are like, I don't know if it's a uh, <laughs> if I should say I have a degree. But I am so unfortunate that I have a degree in finance and economics. And the reason why I say that is it's a very, it's a very challenging way of looking at the world because what we're told, what the academics are telling us, and they're also the people who are running the fund businesses, they're telling us often that the markets are somewhat efficient. Basically, that whatever the price is, it's more or less also what the value is of that stock. Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Would that make sense? Yes, the price and the value would kind of like be the same thing. And, and uh, really, that is very, very often the case. You know, to some extent, yes, the price and the value over time would be very, very similar. Not short term, though, because we don't have to go back to more than the financial crisis. Think 2008, 2009. And you saw the stock price of Coca-Cola almost be halved. I mean, how can something, how can a stock that is making more money before the uh, crisis and then after the crisis, it kept compounding those earnings and it was just slashed. How is that possible? That is just that effect. That is just the hurt behavior, right? 
because the stock market is just priced due to people's reactions. And unfortunately, we can't say only rational people can trade in the stock market. That's not really how it works. So no, the markets are not efficient. But it is hard, it is hard to, it is hard to grasp how to read financial statements. And it is easier to buy into this notion that if price and value just follow each other, then at least I don't have to think about it. And that is, that can be a very dangerous uh, attitude and mindset if you decide to pick individual stocks. Now, let's talk about risk. Um, like it previously mentioned, we need to think about our downside before we think of our upside. The best metaphor I can really give you about this would be football. Okay, so how do you create a winning team? Okay, we all like to see the best players in the offense. You know, that's, that's why we watch sports. But truly, if you dig into the data, you will see that whenever you have a good defense, first of all, that's whenever you can also start having a good offense. And good defense teams, as boring as it sounds, they more often win their games. So let's talk about building a good defense. Because if there's one thing risk is, it's the permanent loss of capital. Okay, so this is the question we should always ask ourselves. How do we ensure that we do not lose money? And I know that whenever I say that, it sounds almost condescending like, oh, so there, there's this guy there on the States and he's, he's telling me I shouldn't lose my money. Like, wha what? <laughs> what is he talking about? But think about it like this. Whenever you speak to your friends, whenever you're around your peers, what is it that you hear? Is that, oh, this is how much money I lost? Or is it, oh, 2018 had been a great year. I haven't lost any money. Or this is how I'm protecting my, my portfolio. No, it's typically like, oh, this biotech stock pick I made 3x on or 4x on. We talk very little about risk, very little about how to limit your downside, and more about where's the upside. So, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about what should you look out for and be a bit more specific about it. I would like to go through three different things that you can look for in the company to protect your downside. So the first thing, the first thing is the top line. So you will look at the financial statements. And you don't necessarily have to pull them from the website. There are quite a few free services out there that were just listed for you, looking back at the past five or 10 years. So if we look at the top line, is it declining, is it stagnating? What are we looking at here? Yes, no surprise, we would like to see a growing top line, if possible. And not only would we like to see a growing top line, we also need to figure out how is that top line growing? How are they, how do they keep making more and more, you know, in revenue? How does that work? Now, it is very popular. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's the revenue, uh, so sales. So if you're Coca-Cola and you sell uh, a bottle of Coke, one dollar, that's your top line, that's your sales. No worries, thanks for pointing it out. So that is really what we're looking at here. And if there is something that's really interesting, for a lot of CEOs, that is to acquire other companies. I typically refer to this as the uh, male ego problem. It is actually, you can actually empirical uh, prove that males are more prone to do this than, than women. Uh, and that's, in this situation, not a compliment. They tend to buy more companies or merge more. You know, it's, it's great, it feels powerful, it feels awesome, buying new companies and growing your top line. But whenever you do that, if you look at it, it's typically not what truly works. It truly doesn't work just to have an acquisition strategy grow that way. You would need to have a product or a service that is so sustainable that you can grow your, your sales. That's really the first thing uh, I would be looking for. The second thing would be declining in margins. 
So whenever we talk about declining margins, it might be gross margin, operating margin, net profit margin. It's basically that is different ways of looking at the profitability of that company, depending on where you are in your income statement. So let me give you an example of this. Um, if you look at a company and you see a growing top line, growing sales, but they're making less and less money, it implies, one thing it implies that the margins are squeezed. So it might be because they cannot no longer charge the same prices. It might be because they are giving heavy discounts. It might be because they do not have a strong negotiation power in terms of securing the, uh, the inputs for the production as cheaply as they could in the past. That is typically a red flag for you guys. It's typically what we as value investors do not want to see. A very recent example would be how retail are just seeing shrinking margins because of Amazon. Yes, they might still be selling the goods, but they're making less and less money out of it. The third thing, and perhaps the biggest red flag to look out for, that would be debt. A company with a lot of debt is clearly a red flag. And just to give you a rule of thumb in terms of what is a lot of debt, it would typically be what they call coverage ratio, less than five or 10. A, a coverage ratio is simply a way of saying, with a normal business, how much money are we making and can we pay back our interest expenses at least five to 10 times? So whenever you are looking into these companies, always question yourself, whenever you're looking at protecting your downside, can I or can this company pay back the interest expenses five, 10 or more times? That's really what you should be looking out for. So that was three pointers to this. Now let's talk about another example. Let's talk about Tesla. Okay, so Tesla, amazing company, amazing founder, right? Founded PayPal or co-founded PayPal and then he used the proceeds to invest in SpaceX, building rockets, pretty awesome, and truly disrupted the car industry as well. I mean, this is, this is an amazing story. Now, the value investors would, would then say, well, let's put a pen in Tesla. Let's, let's think about something else. Let's, uh, let's make a business proposal. Okay, so the new business proposal here, the second of, the of today here, would be, would any one of you into this business proposal with me where you would start out by giving me 50 euros? And in return, I promise to come back, haunt you every single year and ask for two euros more. No, why? What is he rambling about here? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you pay money up front to lose money? Okay, so let's go back to Tesla. And I don't want to bash Tesla too much. I think it's an amazing company. But basically, if you look at the valuation of Tesla, the market cap is around 50 billion US dollars. And they're losing two billion dollars a year. You can actually see that for the past 10 years, you know, they keep compounding their losses. Interestingly enough, the stock price keeps going up. Now, I'm not the one to say that Tesla is a bad company. I'm not the one to say that you can't make a lot of money investing in a company that does not make a profit. I mean, the first guy who invested in Facebook, when it did made no money, he probably made you know, a fortune. And that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, as a value investor, you would say, what if nothing happened? What if truly nothing happened? What if, what if this biotech company, whatever it is, didn't get a, an approval? What if this new fantastic design of Elon Musk doesn't pan through? No, let's look at it. How does it look now? What if nothing happened? What if it was just business as usual? The sales would be the same. The profits would be the same. That is the starting point for a value investor. Before he's doing his analysis, he's saying, how much money I'm paying out and how much money am I getting back? And in the situation of Tesla, you would be fronting 50 euros and then paying me 
two year, every single year after that, which is typically not a good proposition. Now, the reason why I tell this story about Tesla is really to talk about start with the downside. Always, always, always think of the downside. But then, if we should think of the upside, I would like to talk about another company then. Let's talk about a company like Disney. Okay, so if we go through like the three pointers I had before, uh, the top line, um, debt, and the margins, you know, yes, they look good for, that looks really good for, for Disney. But nevertheless, let's look at what the stock is trading at right now. The stock is trading at around 100 bucks at the moment. And the earnings right now is around 7.5 USD. So that translates into 7.5% return. Now, a value investor might be a bit more conservative. He might look back at past years and say, Disney, uh, they've been very successful in recent years, especially this year with everything that's happened with the movies, with the Marvel productions. It's been, I don't think they can sustain that, but they're still making a lot of money. So it might be earnings per share around $5 instead, perhaps $6. Okay, so that would translate into a 5% return or a 6% return. Now, whether or not 5 or 6% is appealing to you is, is really not the point. But the point is, whenever you look at investing like that, you think about what is the downside first. No, it looks like there's not a lot of downside risk with Walt Disney Company right now. That's not the same as saying that if the market is tanking, Warren Disney's uh, price wouldn't be tanking. It probably would, but the value probably wouldn't take a hit. And it wouldn't go bankrupt, it doesn't have any bad debt, or anything like that. So we are trying now to more create a growth case, if you like, or at least say, what is the potential upside of this company that's already making money? So that is how a value investor would do that. Now, if some of you guys are sitting there and you're thinking, so I don't want to invest in Disney, and I don't want to invest in Tesla, and by the way, if you were trying to buy foreign stock, the commissions are just absolutely terrible. I heard someone tell me that it was something like 20 euros or something in commission, like very, very expensive to trade in these stocks. Nevertheless, I don't necessarily think that individual stock picking is the best choice for all of us. If anything, I would say that for the vast majority, index investing would probably be better. Meaning you would buy a market index, call it the German index, and you would buy into the biggest companies in that, uh, in that country. Or another might be, if you're buying into the US, it might be the S&P 500. So you'd be buying 500 stocks in this situation in the US, and you would basically be buying you know, the good companies, but also the bad companies. So companies that make a ton of money, and also companies that owe a lot of debt, and some might go bankrupt, and we don't know. But for most people, it is a very convenient way of investing. Uh, most of us, we have a busy job, we have a family, we do not want to look into financial statements, right? That's why you're done s with school. I mean, you don't want to <laughs> sit and look at financial statements anymore. And I get that. And I want to say that if you do not want to do the grind, if it's not fun for you to go through that process of reading through those statements, and for most people it's not. For most people it's about how do I secure the future for myself and my family? Then index investing is probably the right thing to do. Definitely nothing wrong with that. So uh, I would like to talk a bit about uh, index investing as well. And I would like to talk about how the indexes are priced right now. Um, I've been asked quite a few questions about, uh, is it good to be in stocks or is it good to be in bonds? And generally, it's, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. But across the board, across the globe, it is somewhat hard to make a good return in stocks. If we look at some of the, uh, the Scandinavian markets, we would be looking at, say, Finland or Sweden, uh, they would be priced at around a 5% return right now. 
the US would be closer to a 3% return. So this is kind of like untraditional looking at it like that. And how did I come up with that number? How did I come up with this number that, oh, it's probably priced around 5% or priced around 3%? Um, this is definitely not secret research. You can go in online and you can, you can pull those numbers. And, and the point I would like to give to you here is really to go for uh, the Shiller's PE. It's a very, very good metric that can give you an overview of the different stock markets. So if, if you're into index investing and you do not only want to invest in the domestic market, but also international markets, uh, you can find that. Now, the Schiller ratio was created, not surprisingly, <laughs> by a man named Schiller. Uh, Robert Schiller from Yale University. And what he saw was that just looking at stocks like right here, right now, uh, might be dangerous. You know, you might be at the top of a microcycle or you might be at the very bottom. So what he did was he said, how much would I have to pay to go into the earnings or invest in the earnings for the past 10 years? And then he even adjusted for inflation. So, for instance, in Sweden, in Sweden you would have a Schiller PE of 20. In other words, it would take you 20 euros, probably 20 svenska krona, to buy into one krona of earnings. That is how he's looking at it. And that has proven statistically to be a really good indicator. So I would encourage you guys, if you are into index investing, do not only buy indexes in your own country because you feel better about it. Figure out what is the true valuation of that. That's really the, the most important thing. Now, Warren Buffett, he probably wouldn't be too impressed with a 5% return, uh, even though he's actually a big proponent of using index funds. Uh, Warren Buffett's returns are close to 20% annually, and he started this back in the mid-60s. So if you look at his returns, you would see that compared to investing in an index, he would be making a hundredfold return on that. Not compared to cash, but compared to actually buying the stock market. So should you or should you not do indexing or should you uh, do individual stock picks? And you know, there's really no good answer to that. It really depends on your temperament. Like we talked about before, if you would like to go through that dreadful process of picking individual stocks, it can be profitable. Of course it can. But if you're into, into index investing, and, and most investors really are, then Benjamin Graham in the Intelligent Investor first talks about an index. Um, truth be told, back when it was written, you couldn't buy an index, so it probably wasn't Fair to say that he should have mentioned before, but he was actually talking about building a portfolio uh, very, very close to an index. And he would use an approach that he calls the dollar cost averaging. So if you're not into checking your stocks all the time, if you're really more into living a more stress-free life, Perhaps you should look into this approach about the dollar cost averaging. And basically, it's such a simple concept, but still so few people apply this. And it's basically just the process of setting aside the same amount of money every single month and do it over and over again. So think about it like this. If you did that and you kind of had an idea, well, in the long run, I'll be making my 6% return or whatnot, would you then go in and check the stocks all the time? Would you then spend countless hours going through all of these financial reports? You probably wouldn't, but you will over time compound your wealth. So definitely, this is not my way of saying that individual stock picks are better or indexing for that matter. So let's talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. One of the reasons why you might want to consider investing in individual stock picks still would really be that you have this full control, you know? You're not investing into, call it, 
500 different companies in, in the States, you know, they were included a ton on unprofitable companies, all loaded with debt companies, and of course also some profitable companies. No, you would have full control. You would know exactly what you own and what you do not own. And for good reason, a lot of investors really like that. Well, another thing, and this might be something that's a bit underappreciated, is really that it has great spillover effects. And what I mean about spillover effects is really that you learn to think like an owner. You learn to think like an owner be because before you can pick individual stocks, you need to understand that company and how it works. And it's not only useful if you are looking at your own company, if you start your own company, you're it might be also the company that you work in or the company you want to start one day. You get a lot of free first-hand education for the time you spend analyzing stocks. People tend to become better businessmen and women whenever they become better investors and vice versa. And then of course, then of course we have the upside. We have the upside if you are the next Warren Buffett or if you can just beat the market because clearly if you can beat the market, yes, then you would get a higher return. You're probably not going to make 20% a year investing in the stock market just in general, but of course you can get higher returns if you pick individual stocks. Now then on the other hand, why should you do index funds? Well, as glamorous as it sounds making 20% a year, as cool as it would be to be the next Warren Buffett, well, there's still only one Warren Buffett. So we might not want to stack the, the day against us. It might be realistic about our own time and our own dedication really to the project. And we might say, okay, I understand the underlying reasons why index investing is profitable. It's basically you buy into a share of the biggest companies. These companies are already proven to make money, or at least for most of them, otherwise they wouldn't be in the index in the first place. Historically, it's calling, say, 6 7%. It might be slightly more, slightly less, but that is the type of return that we expect if you invest in decades and decades and decades. Okay, so that might be what you decide to do, and in that case, index investing is truly not that bad. But honestly, I think the best thing about index investing is how you omit too much stress. It is very, very stressful to be active in the markets. And index investing, index investing really optimizes, let's not call it your absolute stock returns, let's rather call it your stress-adjusted returns. And honestly, guys, if you can't sleep at night because you have over-invested or under-invested, whatever it is, indexing is probably for you. Having said all that, I do hope that the key takeaway for you guys after this talk is not about, oh, so the intelligent investor is the first step towards a 20% annual return. Like, perhaps that's surprising me, but I don't think that is really the main key takeaway here. What I really hope that you will take away from here as we're nearing the end of the talk is more how living a life can enable you to become a better investor, living a good life, but really more importantly, how becoming a better investor can allow you to live a better life. And I guess that's what it's all about. So thank you guys, thank you for your time. Thank you Steve, right. thank you. Thank you. Can we take a couple of questions? Sure, let's do so it. So guys, do you have any questions for Sieg about value investing or ETF investing? Yeah, I have. Hi, I have a question about investing like Warren Buffett. I have always been wondering that if I wanted to invest like him, then I will never be in that good position to uh, negotiate about the terms of my investment. 
For example, the, uh, during the last financial crisis, when uh, Goldman Sachs came to Warren Buffett asking for an investment, I would definitely never be as a small investor in that position to ne negotiate the terms. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good. Uh, that's a really good example. So uh, there's this. I want to say was yeah. So even 2008 or 2009, he got this amazing offer by uh, Goldman Sachs, and it was basically, uh, as far as I remember, it was basically a warrant, basically something that is issued by the company with a uh, a, a given dividend attached to it. So he was getting something like eight or ten percent, something crazy, completely secured. And then it could be converted into equity or something else. And then there was like an even higher return after that. And basically, they were not really looking for Warren Buffett's money at the time. They were looking for his stamp of approval. They were looking for Warren Buffett believes in us, then the market will believe in us. Warren Buffett has this reputation of being able to save companies. He's done that before. Uh, the company was called Solomon Brothers. So there's this idea on Wall Street that if Warren Buffett can give us a stamp of approval, then the market will forgive us. That was basically what it was all about. And you're definitely right. As retail investors, no, we cannot get the same type of deals. But it is actually very, very interesting to consider someone like Warren Buffett and consider the returns. Because the more that he has been compounding his fortune, the worse his returns has been. So it's in general, it's not an advantage to be in a position like him. You know, you hear you hear hedge funds, you hear mutual funds, or you might hear not Warren Buffett, but someone else who is saying we're so big that we have great opportunities. And it is true that you have opportunities that you can't get elsewhere if you are a large institution. But if you think about it, that's typically not how it goes. Actually, the smaller you are, the better opportunities you have. Because if you only have 10,000 euros, you can find investments where you can double, triple that. It's very, very difficult to do that when you're sitting on more than $100 billion in cash like Warren Buffett. Uh, yesterday, um, we, uh, I, was, I was getting not a similar question, but a similar point in terms of if you look at the biggest position Warren Buffett now has in common stock, that would be Apple. So Apple, um, that would be $42 billion. Okay, is it because Apple is the best company in the world? You know, a lot of good things to be said about Apple. Uh, right now, priced around 7% return. But yeah, he has very limited companies he can invest in. Apple has the biggest market cap on the planet. And because they do have that, well, then it might be attractive to Warren Buffett. But he can't buy a small Estonian company that might yield 5x, 10x. He did a lot of that in his early career, but he can't do that anymore. He simply has too much money. If he's compounding a million dollars in 10, it doesn't matter. So sorry, that was uh, a long-winded response to that. But uh, I hope you <laughs> I hope I did respond. I have, I have a uh, commentary. Uh, what do you think about that Warren Buffett's one strategy is that uh, he buys companies that can buy small companies, so he don't have to buy himself the small companies. So he have a lot of companies that is that are investing in uh, in different small companies, and also, as you know, Apple has a very huge amount of money sitting on their uh, bank account, and basically they can take over very many good small startups. What you think about this uh, point of view? Yeah, so, uh, to give some uh, some piece of context really to this. Um, Warren Buffett, he, uh, he invests in uh, common stock, so, so he invests in the stock market. But uh, really, he considers his himself being more a manager of operating businesses. So he would have 70 to 80 different uh, companies that he owns or controls outright. And uh, these companies can go in and, and buy other companies. And of course, also a company like Apple, uh, they can also go in and buy other companies as a part of the growth strategy which makes some sense whenever you are at Apple's size. Um, I don't necessarily think there's anything uh, wrong with that. I think in general, whenever you can put in small amount of money, I think that limits your, uh, your universe, unfortunately. Um, but yes, it is. What is kind of unique about the way Warren Buffett runs his company is that he does not run his company. Okay, it sounds like I was doing, uh, <laughs> making a mistake here, but I actually me truly mean that. He does not run his companies. 
Actually, he's very upfront by saying, you run your own companies. Okay, he might buy them out and he might give them a check, but he does not replace management. That is all on their end, so they just continue doing what they're doing. So they can all do what they do best. So yes, is there any problem about acquiring other companies? Probably not. That's probably not uh, a problem. But if you look at where the biggest returns are made, it's typically not by companies who are acquiring other companies. Sure, you might look at a company like Google, or you might look at a company like you know, Facebook, they're quite Instagram, and you might say, well, great investment. But think about it like this. It probably was a lot more interesting for the founders of Instagram. They probably made a better return whenever they were selling themselves to Facebook than Facebook did whenever they were acquiring um, Instagram, at least in percentage terms. I hope I, re I responded to your yes, question. Yes, thank you. Do you have any questions? Maybe some question more. Yeah. Hi. Uh, simple question. How many companies do you usually analyze before you find one that you want to invest in? And how long do you spend on those analysis usually? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> the question, and the answer would typically like, oh, it depends. But let me uh, let me break it down to you. Um, for instance, um, it's a good starting point not to look at a single company, but to look at an industry. So, if you look at uh, say the airline industry, something we also talked about uh, yesterday, then you would say, okay. So we know that there are some really good uh, factors in the airline industry. Uh, we know that the cost structure is different now. We know that the margins are different now. So we are now we're looking at the airline industry. That seems to be a good industry to be in. Then the process would be, OK, so having said that, how many companies do we have? How, much, how many companies would we have in our universe that really makes sense to invest in? And then you would basically compare that. And there are great services. There are great free services where you can go in and then compare across the board, say, the 10 biggest airlines, the 20 base, uh, best airlines. Then so it would kind of like be you know, funneling through that process and saying, well, I probably do not want to invest in companies that does not make a profit. And I do not want to invest in companies that has a lot of debt. So it's kind of like then at the end you might have, you know, four, five, six companies, and those are really the companies that I spend time on. Um, how many hours, how many days, how many weeks? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really difficult uh, to, to, to say. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I would spend up to 100 hours uh, on a stock pick. And, but the thing is, analyzing a stock pick, it's not only about, it's not only about just starting the clock. And then, you know, 100 hours, then it's, then it's good. And I know that was not what you're referring to either. Um, but it's more, it's more like a process because whenever you're done with your analysis, whenever you have come up with what is the value of this company, American Airlines, what is the value of that company? What is the price of that company? That does not mean that it trades at a, value, uh, at a good price. It does not mean that the value is, uh, is higher than the price. What you might come up with is, say, American Airlines, you would say, oh, okay, the price is, I don't know, by heart, but say 30 bucks, and the value is you know, 20 bucks. Okay, if that is your thesis and you're, you're correct, you still have to wait until it becomes profitable. Or it might be that your assessment of that stock changes because whenever that is on your watch list, you will, whenever you hear something about it, whenever they send out a new annual report, then you will keep compounding the knowledge that you have on that pack. So without giving you like a specific answer, that is like the process and just to give you a ballpark number, it could easily be 50 hours, it could easily be 100 hours. Which is also why I said before that it can be hard to do this uh, individual stock picking if you do not have the time, if you not can do that, if you can't do that really uh, to the extent that you would like to. A great question, thank you. Thank you, thank you for questions. So Stig, I would like to really, really thank you with a warm applause from our audience. <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Vaadat, see festival on nagu eraldi teema, sest et siin on selline vaba mõhkkond. Et see on unikaalne võimalus leida teisi investeerimisuvilisi ja inimesi, kes õpetavad seda asja, kes võibolla ei õpeta, aga tegutsevad tihti peale isegi palju suuremates mahtudes kui need, kes õpetavad. Eks? Et see on nagu selline ainulaade võimaluse vabas keskkonnas leida Eesti tegijaid. Tõime esimest korda välis esine ja tõime ta koos assistendiga Lõuna-Koreast lendasid nad Eestisse ja osalesid kokku festival kõigil kolmel päeval. Välis esine ja toomine Eestisse on hästi suur edasiminek meil endale ja kindlasti osaletele, kes tulid. See on hästi palju mõtteid, mida sa tegelikult tead, aga mida on hästi hea meenutada. Ja mulle väga meeldis mõte sellest, et kui ta ikkagi tuleb hakata tegutsema, selleks, et saada sulgepäraseks, mitte olla suurepärane enne, kui sa julge tegutsema hakata. Kord veel jah, tõesti oli väga lahe. Ja minu mõttes on nagu super näida sellest, mis kinnitab, et, et pane kõigepealt strategia paika. Et mida sa hakkad tegema ja sellel kindlaks ja siis tee. Ja see on hästi oluline just selles mõttes, et kui muidu on kahel päeval on ainult esinemised. Esimesel õhtul on lõkkeõhtu, mis on ka hästi hubane, kui inimesed ikkagi peaasjalikult kuulavad. Siis teisel päeval on veel kahel alal kokku kuskil 30-40 esinemist. Hästi palju saadaks see teadmisi kogemusi. Siis me tahtsime alati lõppu luua sellise sportikumasa ka. Me kasutame kõike seda siin kallast loodust ära, et inimesed saaks seda ka nautida. Ja me ühendamegi siis teadmiste poole, küsime investeerimisalas küsimusi stimuleerime meeskonna tööd. Kui näed, et kes võtab juhtrolli, kes, kellel mingi teadmise, mm -hmm. kellel mingi oskused ja kuidas nagu keegi midagi teeb. Ja see aasta oli, oli veel põrrus ka, kus inimest läksid päris nagu vanasti kauplema lipikutega, et sellist asja teha inimestel puhas emotsioon ja puhas mõnu. Investeerimine on selline suht numbrite teema, aga lisades loodus, lisades sportlikku poole ja hommikuti on meil ka jooga ja jooksmine. See annab sellele elustiilile teissuguse tähenduse.